five percent, went up to five percent, went down, 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 down. Went all 2012 went down, starting to go back up again. But look at this line right here. What what what, what people think that is? What what line do you think that is? Um, the median household income. So it's actually gone down, almost like straight down at some points in time. So one of the things is we've got to find our folks that live here in Winston-Salem and Forsyth County better jobs that pay better, Amen. better wages, and those folks can afford the homes that we have. And so it's not just the housing problems; it's a wages problem. And, and yeah. to be honest with me, with, with me looking at this, I I think it's embarrassing that our wages keep going down and down and down. We have lots of job openings. We got people. Uh, unemployment's lowest ever been, but our wages are just not falling. So those are the two trends I'm really kind of looking at and saying those are issues that are going to really bite us in the future. Thank you, Dan. Mm -hmm. On a personal note, yeah. I live on okay. 4th Street. Right across the street, 257 units were built of market rate housing. They're going to build another 257 across closer to the, to the ballpark. The building cost on that was $32 million. The sale price was 52 within two years. That's what the investors are looking for here in Winston-Salem because, as Dan says, there are bargains here. But they're not bargains for the people whose income is following that trend line. Kenneth, thank you for taking, for introducing yourself. I appreciate it very much. Now, to keep the roundtable and the kind of round, if anyone has a burning question they just can't wait to get out and they want to nail somebody with it, feel free. Also, if any member of the uh, panel wants to comment on something someone has said, please feel free to do so. We want to keep it as informal as we can. But we have a lot of participants, so I'll ask that everybody try to be as uh, brief as they possibly can so we can get in, because we'd like to leave some time for questions. Yes, ma'am. I would like to ask Kevin Chisha. I'm Veronica Fitting, by the way. Yes, ma'am. Uh, a little more about the um, site visit performed by HUD for the $30 million potential um, Allotment. Is it something similar to the old Hope Six model, or is it something more creative that's more tenant <coughs> or resident friendly? Yeah, that's a great question, and I, I'll use that. I'll respond, of course, and use that to segue because Kenneth was instrumental in getting us this far with that choice grant. Uh, so it's a great observation. Uh, what I would say is that the CHOICE program has taken the HOPE 6 model, which was essentially a block grant to raise dilapidated housing and build new housing, and has built on uh, what, it, what it saw as a deficiencies in that model. Uh, so the CHOICE grant has a housing component for sure. Mm -hmm. So at Cleveland Avenue Homes as our target public housing site, we will be, if the grant is successful, we will be demolishing Cleveland Avenue Homes replacing those units one for one, but also building uh, uh, market rate housing and housing that is subsidized but not as deeply subsidized so that we have a true community, we have true mixed income housing. Um, so the, the all in, it's going to be about $100 million of new housing that would come out of this $30 million grant. Um, but in addition to that housing piece, there is a people component which is being led by Urban Strategies, which is a national consultant that's done this and done this successfully in many other cities. Neighbors for Better Neighborhoods has been a part of that community engagement effort and that people strategy from day one. Um, and there is, within that people strategy, there is an education strategy. So we had to have Winston-Salem Forsyth County Schools at the table as a necessary partner. Um, Dr. Harrison could not have been more supportive. Her board could not have been more supportive. They've been amazing to work with. I think they're excited about the opportunities that the grant presents, and I know we're excited about having them um, at the table. Additionally, there is a neighborhood component. So HUD says for purposes of this choice grant, not only do we as a housing authority have to be an applicant, but the city has to sign on to that. And we're very thankful that in addition to being our co-applicant, the city, the co-applicant is also our neighborhood lead. So there's a people component, which is supportive services, education, there's a housing component, and then there's a neighborhood component. Well, what does that mean? It means that we're looking to construct within the neighborhood what this grant calls critical community improvements. And I can't recite chapter and verse all that are in the grant proposal, but think things like splash parks, park improvements, streetscape improvements, 
even things like small business loans, revolving lines of credit that could be used to incent businesses to come into the neighborhood. Um, so HUD has essentially said, look, the model of tearing down old housing and building better housing and not providing any infrastructure for the neighborhood or any infrastructure for the residents who were there to prepare them to then go live successfully in this new model, that didn't work. So what can we do to make it work better? And that's what, um, yeah. that's what choice is. I hope that was responsive. Was there, were there two components of that? Did I address everything? Well, I simply asked because as a former employee with Housing Authority and D.D. Adams was a board member. I was one of the seven people who wrote the first Hope Six draft okay. for the city, which is Kimberly Park Terrace. Yeah. And I was really concerned about the relocation process and what, you know, me, I was responsible for all the community forums. And I recall what people were told would, would happen and people were somewhat moved from one public housing community to another. And there were some folks who fell through the cracks. And I was wondering if this choice a model had any preventative type um, modules or whatever that I, would help. I think it's a great question. Let me say two things and then Councilman Brown, of course, if you anything thank you'd you. like to add. Mm -hmm. First of all, thank you for what you did, what you did. Yay. We're actually closing you, out the you, last really. phase of Kimberly Park Terrace right now. We're doing a 17 unit home ownership phase. Yep. We're Very good. Brookside View. That will close out the Kimberly Park Terrace Hope Six grant that you all were responsible okay. for acquiring for our city. Um, that 17 unit model will initially operate as, like, as a like public housing community. It's 17 single family detached homes. They look amazing. Yep. And then the model is we're gonna convert those under a section 30 conversion. And so the folks who are living in those units as public housing residents mm -hmm. will be able to go through a home ownership preparedness program and then will be able to have uh, the right of first refusal on right. acquiring okay. those for home ownership opportunities. So really excited about that final phase, really appreciative for the work that, that, that went in from, from you all, that you all put into that. Um, to your point though, I think relocation, anytime you're talking about redevelopment, relocation is the issue, right? Mm -hmm, it really and, is. and, and our efforts in, in investing in that neighborhood were to be able to minimize the disruptions to our families. And that was something that we talked extensively about Wednesday when the HUD team was down here for the site visit. Right. So I don't know if folks in the room are familiar with the old Brown Elementary School with on right. Highland. Yeah. Um, the original, from yeah, that's yeah. exactly right. Cross from yeah. Shallow, that's right. The original structure, of circa 1919, burned. Gosh, right. two Christmases ago, maybe. So we that was not salvageable. So we demolished that with some assistance from the city, knowing that this was the long-term plan to redevelop that. We had initially tapped that site for the construction of senior affordable housing. What we did with this most recent iteration of the Choice Grant is we said, well, you know what? We could put our first phase of family housing, meaning that site would not be designated or restricted to seniors. We could put our first phase of family housing there, and then families could move from Cleveland, permanent housing in Cleveland, to the Brown School site. So it would enable us to start construction more quickly, and it would also minimize the number of moves. So we could take families from permanent housing at Cleveland, plug them right into permanent housing at the Brown School site, then demo that first phase that's now been vacated, mm -hmm. construct that, then move second phase from Cleveland to New Cleveland, if that makes sense. Yeah. Now that's not, I don't wanna be, you know, rose colored glasses here. There will be some families whose lives are disrupted, right. disrupted more extensively, but we did everything we could yeah. on the planning process to try to minimize those disruptions. We also are staffing up with relocation specialists. Our people partner calls right. their staff persons mobility specialists, right. but it's essentially case management to go ahead and help those individual families identify comparable housing. We know that it will not always be perfect, but they're also going to be assisted with, uh, we call them tenant protection vouchers. They're essentially mm -hmm. Section 8 vouchers that are portable, and then our staff and the people strategy lead staff uh, help identify those units that are available. And, and one of the things that Sometimes I get heartburn about as I think about, gosh, there's 244 families at Cleveland. Right. I know our market can't absorb that. Right. And we know that, right, from the planning standpoint. So it's not like, you know, Friday, 244 families are, are living in Cleveland. Saturday, 244 families have a voucher and they're all, no. you know, released onto the market and the market has to absorb that. We're doing it in phases. 
and the law precludes, we would not allow, these guys would not allow, my board would not allow us to displace a family who did not have a permanent housing option to move into, okay? But separate and apart from, you know, their good intentions, my board's good in intentions, mm -hmm. and my good intentions, mm -hmm. the law precludes that from happening, okay? So before we can start knocking down these units at Cleveland, we gotta make sure each family, right. which of course you know, because you yeah. went through but this. At the rate of $30 million, room. is that sufficient, or are there partners? There's other investments. Right. Other, okay, thank yeah. you. Yeah, great, thank that's you. a great thank point, and, and I don't want to miss a quote. city, it sounds okay. <laughs> but, I don't, and I don't, but it's true. It is true. Because the kid grant is based on public-private partnership it's money really coming it's into it's this deal so because a $30 million grant is not going to make this happen. Right. Mm -hmm. and, you know? And I don't want to overstate the number, but the grant scored, to your point, on what they call leverage. So right. the yeah. HUD goes and looks yeah. at how much has been invested in the neighborhood and how much has been committed to the neighborhood. And to Councilmember Adams' point, we had roughly half a billion dollars yeah. in leverage that went into this. So when you're talking about $30 million in a grant, we're talking about a half a billion dollar commitment okay. to housing and people and neighborhood. Yeah. Okay. Let me give Kenneth his his introduction. Yeah, he's still, although, no, he's still, I'm yeah. sorry, I won't do it justice. <laughs> I, you're a great guy. The people in the room who know him know that. But as I can speak to it professionally, he led the charge for us engaging the community when we first had our planning grant back in 2013. Okay, mm -hmm. he was there. I don't know if Paula's still in the room. Paula was there. She and Kenneth and I went up with some of the residents to DC and we permit, we presented to other folks in the room who had uh, choice planning grants or who were seeking, right. excuse me, implementation grants. And I'm not, this is 100% true, not because they're in the room or we're in this setting. It was their model, okay? And it was their efforts in engaging the community and building capacity that we were presenting on. Okay, it was it was these guys, and, and that truly is what put us on the map. It wasn't our housing strategy, it wasn't our neighborhood strategy, it was our people strategy, thanks to these guys and our efforts that we knew we had to have community engagement. And like I said Wednesday, they made sure that we stayed on task, that this was not something that we were doing for the residents, and this is not something we were doing to the residents, this is something we were doing with the residents. And that undergirded everything that we did starting in 2013, right through last week's site visit. So I'll let you talk, but I, he's been vital to that effort. Uh, well, uh, thank you, Kevin. Uh, I'm gonna say this, um, you know, uh, my name is Kenneth Holley, uh, and I go out Reverend Kenneth Polly. I'm a faith-based leader in the community. I work with Neighbors of Better Neighborhoods, been working with Neighbors of Better Neighborhoods uh, since around 2013. Um, uh, I've been doing um, uh, housing since 2006. Uh, as a private investor and, and looking at how affordable housing can be uh, utilized in the city of Winston salem and other uh, places uh, with the organization and i work with several organizations i'm also the president of habitat uh, in salem Pacific county um, and you know working with Coleman ministries which is a faith-based organization on, in southeast winston uh, we saw some property that was all from uh, cameron avenue in Winston salem that was george black brick homes that uh, were uh, ancient and that was dilapidated and was going to be tore down and we said what does it look like to invest uh, time and effort and see if we can use an asset-based community development approach to bring the community together to make that property livable and we partnered with the city of Winston-Salem with the initiative to help, uh, end homeless veteran uh, uh, to end veteran homelessness and we looked at doing a veteran community and, and the way we did that project you know uh, being a small faith-based organization is by saying how can we get the community and the different trade and gifts and talents and skills in the community to partner with nonprofits and banks and other investors to actually look at how we can revitalize this property and, and provide affordable housing to homeless veterans. Um, uh, four years later, I mean, we was able to actually uh, present to the city of Winston Salem and to the community uh, ten properties that allow veterans and, and, and low-income individuals to have affordable housing. <coughs> Um, and you know, I think that you know one of the things that I think is a challenge today, uh, because even going out looking for property, looking at certain vacant lots and stuff, uh, is that we have a lot of investors looking at property and buying to actually purchase the property and stuff, and it really makes it a, a really a war when it comes down to buying property and seeing how you can invest in it to make it affordable property uh, for homeowners or for those who may want to rent. Uh, something else that I think that is really essential to this work 
uh, that I've seen is that, you know, when you have collaborations with other uh, 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 funders and as well as uh, volunteers and, and, and aspects of investors, that you can actually cut down the cost of what it takes to rehab homes and properties and stuff. Uh, that you can actually look at a long-term investment rather than actually an upfront investment as far as how much you can charge for the rent, but looking at the long-term uh, longevity of the property uh, uh, market uh, selling uh, 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 base to really do the work that you're doing and stuff. And I think that's what we're doing as an organization. Uh, for years, we've actually, you know, around the United States, looked at REO properties uh, and acquired property throughout the United States and did projects, you know, on, on like a nationwide basis as far as trying to uh, provide affordable housing to Homeland Ministries and so forth. Just, just for the audience, could you tell us what REO, some of us know, but if we yeah. know. Well, it's, it's banked on foreclosed property and the banks are not in the building to hold on to property, but now the shift has changed a little bit. Banks are holding on to more property than they should because of some fact that uh, the market crisis that we're in now, you know, so. Uh, there used to be a time where, you know, you had a big sheet of paper if you're a nonprofit and you can show that you can take care of the uh, taxes and other things like that throughout the years. They'll give you hundreds of properties and you can rehab and do certain things and, 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 and sell it to someone who is in a low income family and we'll make sure they have equity going in. Uh, our organization, we do that because we believe that it's no use for us having all the money to ourselves. So we try to find ways we can have homeowners to get into property so they can have equity and not just a high mortgage payment as well. Thank you, Jim. Something that uh, Dee Dee Adams said really struck with me because not so long ago, I first met uh, Kenneth when we were on a joint panel in front of the, the St. Paul's Episcopal Church uh, congregation, I guess. And it was rather amazing to me that some of the questions that were aimed at us seemed to be based on not a very clear realization of exactly what the problem was by those people on the west side, if we would put it that way. So one of the real priorities that I would assume that the Partnership for Prosperity might, be, might consider would be some type of public awareness program that would say these, these are the problems we're facing and these are why they're important that we all deal in. Because poverty and all the things attended to it hurts a city. Mm -hmm. Great. So anyway, Andrea, thank you for coming. You're welcome. Thank you so much. I'm going to break the trend. I'm going to talk from here. Um, I'm Andrea Kurtz. I'm the Senior Director of Housing Strategies at United Way. Um, and I started my work there in about 2006, working with the mayor's 10-year plan to end chronic homelessness. Um, and just a little background on that work, when I started that work in our community, we had about five, between 500 and 550 folks in our community who were homeless on any given night. That number actually hasn't changed, because um, that's about how many shelter beds we have in our community, and our shelter beds are almost always full. Um, two numbers have changed that are really important. At the time I started this work, about 200 folks in our community were chronically homeless, meaning they were homeless for a year or longer and they had a disability. Um, as of today, there are about 21 folks in our community who are chronically homeless who meet that definition. Um, in addition to those 21 folks, we have about 21, 22 folks who are sleeping outside on the street on a regular basis. Um, <clears throat> those folks have a very different and unique housing need um, and they need housing they need a supportive housing and they need housing connected with services. These are people in our community who, with the right supportive services, can be contributing, thriving members of our community. But because we have not been able to find a way in our community to connect services and housing, and I'm talking primarily healthcare services, mental health services, substance abuse services, um, to folks who have great needs, that people are falling through the cracks, right? And the net that catches them is our homeless service system. Um, the other n homeless number that's out there is the number of people who come seeking shelter every year um, in our community. So when I started this work, there were about 2,500 unique individuals who would come and request homeless services during the course of a year. The moment there's about 1,700 folks per year that are coming, that number's dropped. That number dropped because our economy is doing better, right? And because <clears throat> they have jobs, right? But what has gotten harder and where we're starting to see um, some negative trends in homeless numbers is in the length of time people are staying homeless. Um, and so we are, we're very strategic goal-driven in the homeless world, 
Right now we're trying to drive down our average length of stay in homelessness to under 30 days. And for a number of years, we've been on a downward trend. So when I started, as I said, we had 200 folks who were here for, they'd been here for decades, not just more than a year. Right, our average length of time in the homeless system was over 200 days, and we'd gotten it down to about 45, 50 days. We're on an upward trend right now. Um, and a lot of that has to do with there's no housing. Right, I mean, you heard the numbers from the city housing report that we are facing a 30,000 unit deficit in affordable housing. Now that deficit is here now, and it is live. We have folks with housing vouchers that will pay, where the tenant will pay 30% of their income towards rent. We cannot find landlords that will take those vouchers. We have folks that have had approval for vouchers for two over 200 days. They cannot find yeah. units. They have case managers, they have housing, locators who are assisting them trying to find units where we're seeing the right and so this is my fear for crystal powers right is is that you can give folks vouchers right and you can stagger how many we have like 20 folks with vouchers that are trying to find units right now and they can't do it um, with support of folks trying to help them find those units um, and we're seeing two problems in that one is units that are affordable at the fair market rent where vouchers will cover them um, aren't taking vouchers anymore. So we have a, you know, as you've heard a number of folks say, we have a lot of outside buyers coming in. They are big corporate folks that are focused on their bottom line. They are not invested in our community. And so properties where we have had long-standing relationships and they would work with us <clears throat> to take vouchers, take folks exiting homelessness, are now have these corporate offices all across the U.S. and they are no longer taking folks from our community. Um, and they're not taking vouchers. Um, so Greenway is a great example of that. There are over 200 folks out there at Greenway Apartments with vouchers, mm -hmm. and they're all not being renewed. They're not being all that what? We were asking Greenway. Greenway, is that Greenway it's near the. Um, it's up on 30th Street. Yeah. 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 yeah, and those vouchers aren't those leases aren't being renewed. So all of those folks in apartments in the market with vouchers are having to move. Uh, many so of them have been bought purchased as well. Those were purchased in a private sale. Yeah. 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 And so that landlord's not taking vouchers anymore. Um, so not finding like so not being able to find vouchers and finding landlords to who will take vouchers has been a huge problem for us. The other one is where we can find landlords who are local um, is the quality of the housing won't pass inspection. So we won't put folks into units unless they pass our inspections. Um, for a whole host of reasons, not the least of which all of our folks have very fragile health conditions, and we're not gonna put them someplace that's gonna continue to jeopardize their health. But we can't, right, so the units that are out there aren't passing inspections. Um, sometimes, and you'll hear stories from folks, they're not passing inspections for things we're trying to solve creatively, like there's a crack in an outlet cover where they don't have a 50 cent drain stopper, but oftentimes we're looking at problems like mold, electrical problems, problems in floorboards, leaking roofs, um, leaking plumbing and bathrooms that are much more serious health hazard or not, you know, we had one family that was looking in an apartment that hasn't had hot water for two weeks. Um, so I think, so that's another problem is, is that the housing stock that we do have isn't, and is rapidly becoming less habitable. Um, and so all of that makes it really difficult for folks who have lost their housing and trying to get back into it. So we're really looking at this point in, a, in the homeless service system, how do we expand both the number of units that are affordable to folks on very low incomes, and um, we're working with folks predominantly at or below 30% of area median income. Um, many of our folks are working, but they're working part-time, um, and many of our folks are receiving disability income. So that's a really challenging population to serve. Um, I think the biggest challenge, as I see, is the fair market and the open market and the public market aren't going to help folks at this level in our community. If you have folks that are subsiding on less than 30% of our area median income, they need support and they need leadership from our local government, from our city, from our county, from our state, to say we will make sure that there are incentives to create housing that will meet your needs. Um, and there are cities. In Charlotte is doing some amazing work around, their, it's actually their county ban, 
Their county is using county money, not somebody else's money, but their money. They're keeping local money local and building a lot of infrastructure around supportive housing and around affordable housing. Um, and they're connecting it to services to make sure that people can access that housing and be successful in that housing. And it has, has there been any new construction market rate with any set asides for low income? Mm -hmm. Not a lot. Any? They, they've been having. Oh, sorry, I'm stepping. That's okay. Yeah. I'll let Richard. They, they have generally like an 80 percent of median income cutoff, which is pretty much market rate for small units. Um, yeah. I mean, we don't have anyone. Well, I'm not aware of anyone who's doing 60 percent or 50 percent units in any great degree. I know um, um, Goer yeah. just did theirs. I know they have some mixed in there, but generally, where it's being taught is. Uh, it's been addressed by having smaller units uh, at a lower rate, but we're still at, definitely not in Andrea's world at all. It's in yeah. more of the workforce folks, probably at that level and above that is, is the folks we're, we're actually building units. Yeah. I, I think well, one thing yeah. we might not have talked enough about is incentivizing commercial developers right. to... Yeah, I mean, we have to incentivize them, but we have, yeah. Yeah, and, and no disrespect to any of you about that, but when, again, it goes back to if everybody thinks we just write a check and say, here's yeah, here's right. two here's $20 million. Oh no, we're gonna put a bond out there. Well, the bond is tax, y'all, and you gotta still pay for it. And if we do that, it's like the money is still not there to sustain the rents. Yeah. Why would I build affordable housing and let you get in for $500, $600 a month and two years down the road, it's back at market rate. Yeah. You know, everybody got to understand that until we can get, and, and Warren, you're right, the education of what is causing this cyclical cycle that we can't seem to get out of, and we won't if we don't work together. If we don't get the, the salaries of our people right. out who are below average medium income, 30%, mm -hmm. 60%, 80%, you might can make some stuff happen. But... It, it's more than a notion, and when people think, and Jeff, you know I'm telling the truth, people think the city, the county has a, a bucket pot, endless rainbow of money. Mm -hmm. It doesn't work like that. The money comes from you all. The money comes from you. And we're very conscious about raising the taxes to the point that our population is so impoverished. And if we raise the taxes, it's regressive on the people who make the least and have the least. Right. Yeah. But I think, I mean, I think that's an important point, right? Which is, right, if we're going to scale solutions, right? The nonprofit sector isn't in the, isn't able to scale, right? There is no way I can build enough housing to house all the homeless people with charitable dollars. It doesn't like no matter how much money I get from KBR and the Winston Salem Foundation and United Way. We cannot, right? We were talking internally at United Way about building 500 units of supportive housing, which is a drop in the bucket yeah. of our need, mm -hmm. right? That's a $50 million goal, right? We we don't have that money charitably, away, right? Some of that money exists in the public sector, but it only exists if as a community, we come together and say, we value housing in our community and we value our tax dollars going there, right? And so we have to vote that. We have to, right, we have seeded a discourse in our community about what it means to have a government that works for the community, right? We have said, oh, the private sector will take care of it, right? And we, we have seen, right, the private sector exists for profit, right? And so until we have a conversation in our community, our country that says we want a public sector that looks out for public good and can help balance out the goals of the public sector, I mean, the private sector, it, it's not going to happen. So that conversation also has to happen and we have to empower our government officials, right? They can't, they can't do the work of protecting the poor and, and investing and incentivizing, investing in affordable housing if they don't have the backing of the community that elects them and empowers them, right? So we have to have a conversation about ta why taxes are important. Like taxes are important because they pay for roads, they pay for schools, Right? They pay for housing, they pay for medical care, um, and so does private money 
but particularly when we're talking about how do we address the problems of very low income people and particularly low income people with disabilities and other challenges, we have to find a way to support them mm -hmm. as a community and that is either through public or charitable dollars, right? Yeah. And at this point, neither one is at a place where we can sustain and address the needs of people. Yeah, question about the taxes, because yeah. I 100% agree with taxes, so this point is going to be yeah. Yay taxes. Uh, <laughs> just, I mean, taxes. But it's more about the question of equitable tax taxation. Right. Yeah. Like so for instance, you know, who benefits when housing there's a housing, you know, shortage? Homeowners, right? Because housing prices rise, the value increases, right? However, and then we're taxed our one point three percent of the appraised value of the house every year or whatever, whatever was last sold. But if I own a house in the east side of town. $45,000, market value $45,000, appraised value $45,000. I own a house in Buena Vista, where it's, in, and I bought it for 350, and now the market value is 600 because there's a housing supply shortage. They're gonna pay that 1.3% on the 350 that they bought it on five years ago. So the effective tax rate is higher for the person with the lower income house, with the lower market value. So some of it's just, I mean, that's a huge amount of money that's on the table if we taxed at the market rate. Back to Dan's point, you see your house rise in, in $30,000 worth of value, you're, you're taking that surplus. You know, the homeowner's taking the surplus, the people who already have are taking that surplus, rather than, yeah, you really owe the government, you owe Forsyth 1.3% of that. There's also a four-year lag between appraisals. Yep. So the market's been moving up for four years, but there's been no increase in tax value of my house, no matter how much it has, how much its market value has gone up. That's right. Some communities do two every two years, we do, we do, we do every four years. Yeah. I mean, there are tax structures that are regressive and there are tax structures that are more progressive than that. And so I think that's the other conversation, is, right? So there's some conversation I can hear right now about sales taxes. Sales taxes are incredibly regressive, particularly when you're taxing basic needs. If you're taxing food, clothing, and shelter, those are really regressive. Right? And those hit the poor much harder than they hit folks with disposable income. Um, and so what you tax, how you tax, and the, and the way that taxes are distributed have huge impacts on the distribution of wealth in our community. Right. Speaking of taxes, so, Richard, yeah. I think that's going to be, that's going to be one of your we're, subjects. We're working down the, working down, down the, down the table. <laughs> I'm, I'm in the workforce world. Um, so we kind of have Andrea, who's kind of sub- 30% AMI. We then have kind of the sec kind of the, the housing authority world, which is really kind of at 30%. Um, and, and that level, I kind of work in work, not kind of, I, I work in workforce housing, which is for folks who kind of make, uh, depending upon your city, anywhere from the 30% of AMI up into the 60s, uh, which generally is uh, between $18,000 and probably $34,000 for Winston-Salem. So it's, a, it's another group of folks. Um, folks have been hit just as hard in, in some sense. Uh, I'm Richard Angino. I'm with Third Wave Housing. I'm based here in Winston-Salem. I've done a lot of affordable housing in this region um, and really have not done Winston-Salem just because Winston-Salem has some challenges. Uh, but I, I'm doing it now because several friends who are in this room all kind of kept battering <laughs> me saying, why aren't you doing Winston-Salem? And so I started three years ago on this mission of saying, okay, let's, let's do Winston-Salem. I sit on a bunch of uh, affordable housing coalitions across the state, and I've been adamantly telling folks, don't spend too much time trying to analyze the affordable housing program. We have it. We know we have it. We just need to go out there and try to do some, and actually build some units that people can move into. Um, it, it, it's the, and that's how I started with this, was basically, uh, we started doing this in Chatham County, which was, they have a affordable housing coalition. They spent the last two years coming up with what's the issues, how do they come up with policies. What I said to them was, let's just do some units. And every time we hit a roadblock, let's try to change the ordinance, let's change the rules to make it work. And there we're building 48 units right now. We're actually building our second 48 in Chatham. Uh, here in Winston-Salem, we're building out near Kester Mill. Um, we're actually building 48 units that's affordable there uh, through the uh, Section 42 tax credit program. Um, the, uh, and at the same time, we have probably 250 units of, of units that are shovel ready. We could have people moving in in 16 months from now. We could have people moving in units if we could come up with the right tools out of Winston-Salem and the group to make it happen. 
So we have the expertise. We don't really need to bring people in from far away places to, to build affordable here. We got a lot of talented people who all understand the, the business. And my big push right now is let's take the talent we have and let's just go out there and make it happen. Um, we have a couple things that are taking place right now. We have like a perfect storm in Winston-Salem. Uh, it, it's, it's, we're probably a good example of what's happening. We have had HUD basically over the years shutting off all the money. They started on the private organizations that had the private buildings. Um, that was 15 years ago. I've been doing this for 30 some years now, so I've grown up in this business. Um, they started in the private sector, which was all the Section 8 based complexes that we have quite a bit here in Winston-Salem. Uh, they basically started shutting off the money about 15 years ago. It started with inspections of saying, okay, here's your REAC inspection, which is basically each property has to go through and do an analysis each year. Each year. Basically, they got to the point where they were failing everybody because you have 1960s, 70s buildings, none of which is modern, and then they're trying to judge it off of modern rules of today. And so what that slowly did was basically take a lot of our 1970s, 80s properties and make them obsolete. And then basically they shut off the money, just as you were saying. It's, it started on the private sector, Section 8, and I'm now watching Burlington Housing and over, they're now doing this with the housing authorities. It's going through the same systematic way of cutting off the funds to keep these properties running. Um, so people keep pounding away on them and, and you understand what's going on is basically they're shutting off the money to keep them up. And by doing that, you basically are setting them up for failure. And then slowly, one by one, these buildings are being boarded up and because the liability is too big from the exposure that you end up boarding them up. And then they're ending up flipping into things. Um, North Carolina as a whole, our last, naturally, and I kind of work more in the, as we're kind of looking at the chart, I'm kind of more in the self-sufficient tenant world. The last naturally occurring affordable housing that was built in in, in North Carolina was really the 80s and probably a little bit in the 90s, which doesn't sound like a long time, that's 25 years ago was the last market rate affordable stuff that was built out there for the regular working folks to move into. Um, so we had this whole slug. For 15 years, we had no new apartments being built in most of these marketplaces. And I kind of take Charlotte and Raleigh out of this because they're growing at a Winston-Salem population every couple of years. Yeah. So that's a huge animal. But when you get to the general markets, we typically have done the, the uh, smaller transaction areas. Um, so we've done Statesville, Hickory, all those types of locations around. Um, so what's basically has happened is we have no new affordable housing has been built, just naturally occurring affordable housing. Um, we then have uh, basically about three different things that are happening. We have a whole bunch of people who are not, there's kind of in the industry, you look at it as people who are renters by choice, and then you have renters who have to rent. And what I'm referring to is the people who have to rent. What's happened is the renters by choice is this new marketplace that's coming in in the last 10 years, which are the millennials and the boomers, both of which are well capitalized. Um, in the sense that they have the ability, they're not at renting at 40% of AMI. These are folks that are coming in at 100% of AMI. I mean, when I say AMI, that's your area median income. This is a fairly well capitalized group of people uh, who are deciding to rent instead of buying a house. And so they have a completely different rental segment. That's what we're seeing in downtown. That's, you know, the traditional market for Winston Sales has been kind of the $650, $700, kind of what you were referring to. This is the new group that one bedrooms are 1400 bucks. Mm -hmm. And that's double it. Yeah. And the household formation is now occurring in the late 20s and early 30s. Exactly. So they're, they're gonna be around a while. <coughs> so you have this large group. So you got the, basically the boomers, which are 75 million people. You have the millennials at 95 million people, all deciding they want to rent apartments. As it, I'm, I'm generalizing a lot, but percentage of people who want to rent apartments is really large. It's two huge populations that are basically saying, let's rent. What's happening is that's displacing all your affordable folks. Yeah. And as you look around here, we're doing Peter's Creek right now, which is the budget motel. Um, within a stone throw of that building, we've seen a whole bunch of those buildings all be clearing out. Yeah. And there are investors from other places. They were rents that were $800 a month. They basically are the brick buildings and they're basically moving everyone out 
putting up the, the, the drive, basically putting up the plywood in the windows and then trying to figure out how do they upgrade those and then rent those for fourteen hundred dollars. And that's the and that's what's really hit. That's what's hitting the workforce world because a lot of those folks work at they work at the hospitals. They work at all these other locations, and all of a sudden they're now being displaced from that stuff. So. I know one of your questions was whether people are getting displaced from the apartments. It's clearly displacing. The I remember, I believe it or not, there are not many in the room who will remember urban uh, renewal. Oh, of course. <laughs> I was there for that, and I don't know that any program of the federal government displaced more people. They did. They did. Yeah. I was just noticing, Dan, I think a lot of people have made your point that we may have an income crisis as well as yes, an affordable yeah. Prices. Yeah, and that's and really why the why the construction stopped at the in the eighties. Yeah, was the meat incomes not keeping up with what it costs to build something, and it's mathematical. I mean, the reason we're not getting new affordable is you can do the math. We the the product has to be the same as what the new construction market rate fourteen hundred dollars a month is product, but you need to be able to rent that for eight fifty to somebody, and mathematically you can do the numbers. Um, you can, for each one of these, you can figure it out. Um, the other component of this was basically workforce housing, which was the tax credit program through 9%. The state has cut off most of the tools now relate to us doing anything like downtown Winston-Salem. The, um, the state agency has, so we've kind of talked about the federal government shutting things off. We now have policies that are coming out from the state that basically are cutting off the tools for us to do some of these infill properties that we're talking about. Um, they just shut off the workforce housing loan program, which is like $20 million. That was just shut off and cutting over the last budget. Um, so, and at the same time, the tools are set up to do suburban new construction kind of out in the county. Um, the money, NCHFA is tagged to only things that are 10 years older or younger, which most of the product you look around Winston-Salem, most of the product we would want to work on is older than 10 years. So a lot of the homeowners programs you can't access. Um, when you deal with the tax credit program, they it's set up to be the lowest poverty census tracts is basically the is basically the the uh, cutoff right now. Well, Winston Salem got 25% poverty. We cannot compete with Clements. So basically, what's happening is all the new properties are going to Forsyth counties areas that have really low poverty. And I know there's different logic as to if that's good or bad to move people from downtown to out to Clements. Um, but basically the system's being set up related to that. Um, the logic is that it's why, why keep people in neighborhoods of poverty? Let's move them out. Uh, at the same time, you got a lot of folks who are in neighborhoods, and well, I, and when I say census tracts, the, it's, it's based upon data, basically the, um, Innovation quarter is 44% poverty. Yeah. So we could not do any affordable housing in the innovation quarter, even though those apartments are $1,430,000. Yeah. Um, so the system's kind of really working against that and trying to work in this section. Um, at, at the same time, it's basically working on what tools we have. Uh, a lot of cities out there um, have really spent time and energy coming up with new affordable housing programs. Uh, Asheville has a very active uh, ability to make affordable housing happen. Um, they have the same puzzle as they have seniors moving to this country, to this state. Um, it's a big puzzle. Um, we have about 114,000 people moving to, to North Carolina every year. So that population is causing this displacement also. 50% of those are seniors. And a good majority of those are earning 150 thousand or more a year. That's displacing another whole group of people from these marketplaces. So I sound so pretty dismal on this, <laughs> but I, I keep being asked, kind of, what's happening to our housing? And then I was just in Asheville and their biggest puzzle is almost everything brand new that's being built is Airbnb. Right. Yeah. And so you have all those components added on top of that. And you basically, that's where your affordable housing in your workforce side is where everybody's being displaced related to that. Um, Thank you. I could talk for 12 hours, but <laughs> <laughs> well, we did promise we'd be out of here by 8 o'clock, yeah. so uh, and I do want to leave some time for questions because I think you really generated an awful lot of thought here. Might even want to try to come up with a solution or two, but I think that maybe has to be reserved for another day. Dean, you want to introduce yourself, please? Okay. 
Well, I'm Dean Clifford, and I'm sitting here wondering kind of why I'm on this panel. Um, because I would come with a very different perspective. It's more just the personal impact kind of stories. So my background is that I, was, I started out as an educator and uh, was in the school system. And what I saw there in terms of impact is mobility. Kids moving several times a year because families couldn't find something they could afford. And that puts a real um, monkey wrench in consistency of education. And it's one of the challenges that kids, families, and the school system have to deal with. So that was, that was one place. Then I, I did uh, home visitation for family support. And my two areas were Ardmore and Kimberly Park. And the parents asked all the same questions about how to raise their children, but the struggles that they dealt with were entirely different. Um, and that was another piece of my education. So what I'm really talking about here is the chances I've had to be educated. Now I wouldn't even go into my own personal story because we had a bankruptcy and we had four little children. And so we, we went through some of that stuff too. But as I got back into work and got things leveled off for us, I was beginning to see some of these other um, pockets of need that just weren't working in our society. Um, then I was asked to be the director of the Smart Start effort, and what that did was to, a lot of things, that focused on early education, family support, health, and mental health for families with young children, but it had to be done so collaboratively that in the early days of Smart Start, we were beginning to understand systems and how systems were disadvantaging people and how policies were terrifically important in terms of getting us what the policies were designed to do instead of what we needed to be doing. Um, so I got that, that perspective. About that time, the Center for International Understanding asked me if I would lead a group to Norway for a home study. And that was very interesting because I had to study up since I was gonna be the leader of the, of the experience. And the Norwegian literature said that their goal as a government was to be sure that every single citizen had enough to live at a good standard of living. Now to have a country say that that was their policy, to make sure that every citizen had what they needed to live well, that gets us back to the fact that we gotta do something about wages. I mean, we've got a broken system in terms of where the money goes and who gets the money. Um, and until we fix that, and some of our discriminatory policies, we're, we're fighting an uphill battle on some of these other things we're talking about. So the next thing that I guess um, maybe got me kind of in the thick of that was that I, when I, I'm one of the oldest people in the room, okay? So I'm retired, supposedly, all right? That means I don't make any money. Uh, but it doesn't mean I'm not busy. <laughs> And one of the things I did was to start being doing volunteer intake for Sunnyside Ministry. And you listen to story week after week after week of folks who can't make ends meet. And rent was the biggest problem. I always dreaded it if somebody was gonna come in and need help with rent because Sunnyside had a small budget. It was easier to pay the electric bills. It was easier to pay the water bill and some of the other things. But these families, most of them were working families who had absolutely no cushion. Any crisis that came along, the car broke down, they can't pay the rent because they've got to fix a car in order to get to work. And the rental folks are not very patient when you get behind on your rent. So I got that piece of the puzzle. And the last thing I'll mention, because I know we need to wind up some of this part, is that I got involved with refugee families. And one of the tasks was to start by, if you're on a good neighbor team, you're supposed to do a lot of things for refugee families arriving, one of which is to help them find a place to live. And a lot of refugee families were being housed if they were small enough, small families, no more than two children, maybe three, at a, a complex that was called the Ledges. It's now been purchased and under new ownership, the residence is Diamond Ridge, I believe is the name of it. Um, and the rent's going up. And so the refugees are being displaced because it's no longer affordable. It's right behind where y'all are working, yeah. okay? Um, 
Um, and so I got a taste of that. We formed a coalition to come together and address in a systemic way the problems refugees were facing, because that was my way of thinking. We do systems work, okay? We had a task force on education, a task force on employment, and a task force on housing. Guess which one has struggled the most? Housing. housing. Big grant. And there, it's also not just the price of housing, but some of these refugee families are very large. We had a family of 10. Well, almost no rental housing is available for that, a family of that size. So we really have a significant problem, and it's one that, um, you know, if you do much driving around in our community, everything I see that is new is on the upper level, not just apartments, but also homes. Um, and so we are leaving behind a significant portion of our population, and we can't afford to do that. And it's such a multi-level problem. I mean, it starts in terms of how we are educating the children and how we are equipping the families. Um, there was a employment shift out in the northwestern part of our country where, you know, uh, lumber jobs and those kind of things were going away. And I read an article not long ago. It was affecting both uh, Washington and Oregon in the United States, but it was also affecting right across the border, Canada. Our solution to that problem as a country was to say, okay, well, I guess they'll have to go on welfare because their jobs went away. Canada's solution was to say immediately, these people have got to be trained for the new jobs that are coming. So we've got to be much more proactive as a culture in saying, how do we help people find out their best skills, their best abilities, give them the training they need to match the jobs that are here so that they can make a living wage? because it's criminal for people to work and not have enough to live. That's my question. Thank you. Ms. Kelly, would you have anything to say? Uh, my background is uh, in retail, and then I was uh, kind enough to build a project, uh, Council Member Adams Ward with Jeff, and uh, I will say to you, the first time I approached uh, Council Member Adams, um, she wasn't the most, uh, how would you say it, Didi? That's my management and leadership style. Yeah. I, I kind of equate it to, uh, I've been there, it was kind of the, uh, I still have the post-it note where she wrote the words, no. And uh, so we got to know each other. Shame to my game, people. Yeah, she, she actually had my son with me that day, and he looked at me like, uh, Dad, uh, I think she's, real serious in that work now. <laughs> and uh, so she and I would get together a few more times and I'd still get the words no. So it was kind of like the Wizard of Oz theory. I had to figure out how to get the broom back. And uh, so after about mm, several hundred no's, she gave me her outline of what she wanted. And, uh, and it was to build something that would take what we call the Wake Forest kids out of the neighborhoods and put them in a place where it'd be supervised because Dee Dee would tell me stories, and Dee Dee, I hope you don't mind. In her own neighborhoods, these Wake Forest kids would drink their beer, throw it over in Dee Dee's yard. They didn't know it was Dee Dee's yard, it was just a yard. And knowing Dee Dee, as you all probably know, she'd wake up the next morning and she had the best time ever because she'd throw those beer bottles back in their yards. So I'm here just to say, listening to this very inspirational conversation. Uh, one thing that I can bring to the table is to share how tough it is in the current culture of development dealing with the lenders themselves. Mm -hmm. And I think you all need to know the lenders are as tough on the developers today as anyone. And believe it or not, in our in Dee's ward, which gosh, great folks, Jeff's ward, uh, we did not get any local lender support. Wells Fargo said no. Uh, BB&T, which is all over uh, the community, said no. And we had to go to a lender in Ohio who finally said yes. So I want you to be aware as a group that a lot of the challenges that we have, uh, let's call them the private sector, because that's all I know, is lenders today underwrite deals so strict and so hard, it's hard to fit it in the box 
And, and like I say, if you go to a local lender like Wells or BB&T and they said no to a project in a beautiful neighborhood, two tenths of a mile from Wake Forest, that can tell you how hard they underwrite them. So I want you all to know a lot of the challenges, again, I don't know you, but from your conversation as a private person is, uh, lenders are some of our biggest obstacles because we have the best intentions of the world to do things right and do them per, let's say, Didi's uh, thoughts. Like I built a Walgreens in Didi's ward, and one of the biggest beefs that she had at the time were retaining walls. Yeah. And so Didi again said no to me. This was when I first met Didi. <laughs> so, you know, I was prepared when I came in the second time to hear no because she told me no about 300 other times on the other project. But her biggest project concern was. Mike, I want you to build me a beautiful retaining wall because the McDonald's on North Point had just built this gray, kind of ugly it's looking cinder wall, block. cinder block wall, but yet they built this beautiful box. Yeah. Well, I call them a box, you know, let's say a $3 million McDonald's. So here's an interesting fact. So I go to Walgreens and I say, Walgreens, the council member for this ward wants a beautiful retaining wall. This wall, by the way, Didi was about $400,000. And would you believe Walgreens said no, the lender said no, everybody would not support what Didi wanted. So what we ended up doing is rather than putting in that traditional 25, 30% equity in the deal, uh, we went and built a wall that would meet Didi standards, which was a solid concrete wall. And what's interesting with Didi, you got you had perspective on this in 2013. What do we see now, the uh, DOT building on all the interstates, um, are those sound barrier walls. Sound and they're built exactly like Didi wanted, and that was to drive the steel into the ground, not build some little cinder block wall that is going to stain and look horrible over time. But Didi's theory was, Mike, I want it to be there for forever. I want it to look good forever. And what we ended up doing was we'd use these, what's called an H-beam, steel structure and it's identical to what the state is doing now yeah. and this is like seven years ago Dee, Dee told me what she wanted and i get the biggest kick out of driving down 40 especially i live towards the clemens way in advance and all the structural steel h beams going in the ground to do exactly what you asked us to do seven years ago but the point of the story is not only did Dee, Dee have the foresight to do that but the lender said no Walgreens said no, nobody would support the building, the aesthetic commitment to it as well. So at the end of the day, I think some of the challenges that I'm here today to learn about uh, the affordable housing, the workforce housing, because I think it's time that maybe I bring 40 years of doing retail and student housing to you all and what I've learned as a way to give back and uh, because of what Didi's done for me. So at the end of the day, I'm just here learning and. But I will say again, lenders are some of our biggest challenges. But at the end of the day, you've got great leadership and I've learned a lot just listening here today. And I thank you for that. And, and Didi, you're, you're the best. And thank you for saying no so many times. So. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Mike. Well, we're very fortunate we have with us Jeff McIntosh, who's also on the city council. And I'm going to ask him to kind of tell us what we have learned here tonight. Um, clearly, we have a problem. We have many problems, I guess, but we did, we haven't really talked about some things that might help at this point, and that's what we're going to have to come to grips with eventually. So, Jeff, if you'll wrap us up. No pressure, no pressure. Um, I'll start off by going back to something that Richard said. There's a tremendous amount of talent around this subject in the city of Sound County for site. So we have the tools, we have the talent. Now it's designing, figuring out what we want, figuring out the tools and how to, how to implement it. So I want to go back and talk about the original question of what are the two things about um, that are most salient as far as um, our, our, our housing gap. One is that nobody's building starter homes anymore. And you go down that rabbit hole and you talk about the cost of construction, but you also talk, you have to talk about zoning, and I'm going to come back to that. And the other thing is that the poverty gap, low wealth, is persistent, and if you can't get into that you can't get engaged into that arena of building wealth through home ownership or equity in some entity that's building wealth, then you're just living, you're gonna live paycheck to paycheck your entire life. Um, so it's a numbers game, whether it's 15,000 or 30,000 or 50,000 or 60,000 or whatever the number is, 
we are so far away from being able to fill that gap that we need to start chipping away however we can. No silver bullets, just silver shotgun shock pellets. The choice program, how many how many units will that build um, yeah, roughly? It's I mean, almost 500. Okay, so yeah. we need, let's call it 15,000. 15, let's 15, generous. Let's the make the gap as small as possible. So there's 500. <laughs> AD, you know, we're at 14, five. So ADUs, auxiliary dwelling units. We have the most restrictive policy in the entire state of North Carolina about putting building a granny flat in your backyard or in your Tiny basement. House. And so the people that are the people who want to do that, they're going ahead and doing it, but they're doing it without being inspected. And that's really not safe. That's not dangerous. Okay, so there's another thing we can do. Dee Dee and I are both on this. We we got beaten down last time. We're not going to get beaten down again. No, we're not. Tiny houses, okay, I'm just gonna come back to my talk I about plan to live my talk about zoning. <laughs> Missing middle. If you drive around Winston Salem and you got any sense of history, and I've restored, my wife and I've restored several dozen um, 1920s era houses in Winston Salem. And our finished products were have always sold from like seventy-five thousand dollars to one hundred thousand, one hundred twenty-five thousand dollars. So we you know we were doing stuff on the cheap, but it was always to the national register standards. But if you drive around Winston Salem, I can point out duplexes that were built in the 20s all over town in all different kinds of neighborhoods. The garage apartments where they exist in Winston-Salem is in Buena Vista. That's right. Right. And West End and the older neighborhoods in town. Holly Avenue mm -hmm. has got a significant number of um, buildings that were built as single family converted to duplex, but also some 1920s apartment buildings Correct. right in the fabric of a 1920s single family neighborhood. So you can no longer do those things. We have single families on ourselves to death. And so now if you want to if you want to add housing, you either have to come in and tear down some stuff or you have to go to green fields, which is incredibly expensive and it doesn't pay for itself over time, so it places a burden on the municipality. If you ever get a chance to read any of Chuck Marone's stuff, he's with a, an organization called Strong Towns, and he explains very succinctly why we cannot continue to build ourselves out and stay solvent. Up until post-World War II, when we got the magic of the automobile, communities reinvented themselves. When more people wanted to live in a place than there were room for, somebody tore something down and built something bigger. We just don't do that anymore. We build out. So these are all things that I think we need to work on. Um, we did, we, as a council, we passed UDO 283, which said there's a structural change going on in the way people are using land. These pieces of property that are zoned for office and highway business are not really viable for that anymore. That's right. So you should be able to come in and buy right without asking any, any questions or going for any neighborhood scrutiny. All right. Build an apartment building. That's right. All right. We I, I thought it was brilliant. We thought and we it thought was, it was no problem. take off. And we got beat to death on it. We finally got it passed. Um, it protects neighborhoods from intrusion of big structures. So anyway, there's lots of education going. On. That's one of the things that we really need to do. So. Uh, I'm skipping around here, I realize, but the PCC design program, I mean, the, 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 the scale of the dollars that we're going to need, that project, the city put in 600000 the county put in 600000 it's a $10 million project, and it's 72 units, so it's $10 million. So I, I think we as a community should do something that was talked about here tonight. We should go find out how much this community values affordable housing, and let's ask them to put their money where their mouth is. Right? Let's do fifty million dollars of public money and tie it to fifty million dollars worth of private money. And Charlotte, the way that was done with the banks, did no interest loan or low interest loan, and they got to count that off as their contribution. Do we, as a community, really want to support that? If we don't, hey. we're about where we are now. And we'll right? stay. If we don't ask, we're, we're where we are now. Let's ask. Right. This only works if the people that we are building housing for can build equity into the deal. Mm -hmm. And I've talked to several people here about an equity structure. If you're a tenant, you should be able to, every 10 years, if you stay in one of these properties, you should get a check, right? That's your equity. You're part of a corporation that pays you for living there and keeping up the community. Some of it's a little, a little wild, a little, you know, a little crazy, but there's got to be some buying. There's got to be some reason to stay in that community and not move as soon as you get wealthy enough to move out, because that's right. what's happening now. Right. So we got a lot of work to do. Uh, but I think we have the talent in this community to do it. I know we have the wealth. The question comes down to do we have the wealth? And I, we don't know if we've got the will unless we go ask. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you. And one of the things that I want people to understand, in the world we live in right now, 
this part hasn't changed. If you're not, I, I keep telling people, Winston-Salem, I think we need to have a, a, a demonstration of civil disobedience. That doesn't mean tan up nothing yet. But until we show up downtown on a Saturday afternoon where people can see that the people that are the most affected and the people that care about this city, it, it won't. You got to help people, we got to help people understand that it is now or never people we got selected for everyone home by Grounded Solution, a national home community. Go Google it, go Grounded Solution. And in their uh, menu, you'll see for everyone home. They selected Winston-Salem, San Antonio, and Minneapolis because they selected three cities as prototypes. Indianapolis. Indianapolis. They selected, <laughs> yeah, it's Annapolis. That's Maryland. Somewhere right? in the Midwest. They selected three cities to put together a, a, a catalyst of how we are going to address with strategies and action items, solutions, people, engagement. This housing crisis is all over the country. And they chose three different cities as day and night because they wanted us to be the benchmark for other cities that are like ours or smaller or growing to ours. They only spent 18 months doing this. As a matter of fact, uh, Paula back there is our uh, consultant uh, for everyone's home. Uh, they have a group, a team that works. But we want to come and also do a presentation. I think she might have, but the group would like to do one too because we've got to educate everybody even more so than the things we're seeing on the national level and we travel and we listen to horror stories. Winston is on the bubble. The next level is catastrophic crazy. You think LA and San Francisco got it bad. When you go there and people are living in villages on the street in covered tents and things. Winston is at that bottom part of the bubble, unlike San Antonio and Indianapolis up here. So I'm asking you, like I said, this group, if you really want to see what people care about this housing crisis, somebody needs to have a civil disobedient demonstration mm -hmm. of downtown with signs, bands, children, elderly, everybody, all us in the pot. Because I don't think people are taking us serious enough because they know all we're doing is talking about. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, a lot of yes. cities are basically realizing that they can't get new employers to come to the locations because they don't have the housing. And I, I deal with a bunch of cities right now that basically, they used to have people come there, a big plant would come there and say, okay, we're gonna put 500 jobs there, or we're down Siler City, we have this going on right now. We're gonna put 500 jobs in this neighborhood. Now the employers are basically saying, okay, where's our 500 people gonna live? Right. And it used to be, well, North Carolina, there's plenty of places for people to live. Now they're basically saying, Okay, if you can't show us the 500 places that people can live making $35,000 a year, we're gonna go find another place. That's and right. so I'm working with a bunch of cities who are just in panics because they can't get new people to come there because of lack of employers. Places. Well, well after hearing Dee Dee, everybody ready to march? <laughs> <laughs> I think she's absolutely right. I've been in a few marches myself for affordable housing and it's, it has its moments, but it is, it is effective if you get out as a community and show how strongly you feel about something, then you will be taking notice of it. Uh, I'm going to open up for questions. I, we don't have a lot of time because we'll try to get as many in as we can. We do have one to start. Uh, this was handed to me. Consider asking what, if anything, is being considered to address the fact that Wake Forest, Baptist, and Novant two of our largest employers are tax exempt yeah. and any property they own is not taxed. How can we address the loss of tax revenue when they purchase commercial real estate, i.e. Sears building at Paint Mall? Go vote. I told you how all this happens, Warren. You know how this goes. The people in Raleigh determine and the federal government tax exemption for hospitals, churches, 
faith-based schools, even this group, nonprofit. But you occupy a great percentage of property in the city and every city in the country. High schools, the county, universities, colleges. That's money that you and I are paying for all the services that nonprofits and tax exempt get. If we, Woodson Salem, cannot change any of that, I don't care what the council does, what the county does, what even what you do. The only thing that saves us is your vote. Your vote at the federal level, your vote at the state level, that you recognize. And I'm not, you know, people don't like it when some of us say this. I've been saying this since I got on the council. How come they don't get to put, nobody in non-exempt world get to put nothing in the bucket? But yet, you as a taxpayer have to. Right. Why wouldn't they give, based on profit, income, whatever, worth to the community, that you put something in the bucket? It's like passing the plate. If all you can put in is $100, we'll take it. Because it'll pay for that police ride by here up and down all night. If you can put in a thousand dollars a year, we'll take it. We even did a, 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 a study to see how much money we'd have if everybody that's tax exempt paid money and wants to say them. We have enough money to, to do any affordable housing. Everybody, we live like it all. We think we in Kansas. <laughs> Everybody be in the house. We moved to Western Salem because my wife said, I want to go to a town that promotes itself as the city of arts and innovation. Since arriving here, for the very reason that Dee Dee's just talking about, I've heard people say, well, we're going to have to change that slogan. It's going to have to be the city of artists and innovation That's right. because the not-for-profits aren't caring. The, the profit-making big industries that used to support the Art Council, which has had two years of a deficit in their budget, they're not here anymore. Nope. And something has to make up the difference if we're going to be a city of the kind that we're all proud to live in. Well, we've had quite a discussion here tonight. Does anybody have any burning questions that we just need to, or any question at all as far as that goes? Yes, ma'am. Really quickly, and I'm not, um, I, you know, and I know that the um, examples in Chapel Hill and Orange County, North Carolina, and Davidson aren't perfect. But has anyone ever considered mandatory inclusionary zoning as an option? <laughs> has it ever been talked about? Talk to them, Jim. Go ahead. Tell them what there, happened. There's actually, well, we have a couple things against us that like California and others don't. And my understanding is that at the state level, there's actually rules that we're not allowed to require people to have affordable housing in their units. Uh, if you're in California and a lot of other locations, you build a new apartment building, you have to do 10% affordable. Right. Or you have to contribute money towards it. Right. We have some uh, unofficial ones, like Asheville's somewhat building this, where they're kind of pressuring people into new affordable housing and then giving money related to it. But technically, they're not supposed to legally be able to I'm going to take that back to Mike's comments, and that, that impacts your, your ability to finance a property. Mm -hmm. It does. It really so, does. It's amazing. So, so, is it the fees or? Well, you know, because remember they underwrite it in such a way that um, it's all income driven. Yeah. And, and it's all driven to a certain, what they call a debt service coverage. I might get too technical here for you. But so, so, so what happens is you, you have that income coming in and then as that starts to, numbers start to change, mm -hmm then that debt service coverage changes and yet your expenses they remain the same. Mm -hmm. So what happens then as a, as a developer, and again, I teach this at Wake Forest, so I, if I sound like a teacher, bear with me, is that it, it, all of a sudden the equity requirements start to really uh, impact the project because normal today, so you all know, lending in my world is somewhere around 70% of cost. So let's say it's a uh, let's say it's a that's a pretty good number. If, you, if you're lucky, you get 75 percent. So 70 percent on a 10 million dollar project. So that's three million dollars of equity. That's based on that income stream. Let's call it being 700 dollars per per door. Uh, well, all of a sudden, if that seven drops to four, then all of a sudden that equity that you just dropped in for 30 percent might go as high as. 50%, yeah. and, and all of a sudden is, then that's why the developers 
uh, let's call it in the market rent world, walk away. And that's what you don't want. And because it's the, as I started my conversation earlier, the lenders control the show in, in our world anyway. So if you start spreading that rent differential out where X is here and Y is there, then the equity requirements become so large that all of a sudden now that project that you had three, you now have five, where you can go do a market rate deal and only have to put three. So all of a sudden you can make the decision is, you know, is not hard to do. So just be aware that a lot of times we as developers have great intentions, but when the bank underwrites it, the appraisers, those are the guys who shoot us in the head. Because I'm doing a project right now up in Virginia where I'm converting seven homes into uh, uh, three apartments per house. And in, in the appraiser, we, we, we went through all the drawings and all the commitment of all the things we're gonna do to improve these houses. So I'm right across the street, it's in Farmville, Virginia from a school called Longwood University. I mean, literally right across the street. And by the time he, he did his appraisal and his cost and his expenses, he challenged the deal close to a million three hundred thousand dollars less than what we had put the value at, and we had basically put it at cost. So all of a sudden, that project that was 25, 30, 35 percent equity now is at 50 percent. But the problem we were so deep into it, we didn't know how to get back out of it. And, and, and so we're kind of in there right now, hoping and praying we can just get whole. And uh, so to answer your question, that's some of the challenges that you have is the way they underwrite them and they appraise them. Yeah. A good, good, example, good example of that is actually Peter Street, the question at the end. Um, I mean, we're literally, the lake is, is two blocks away from us and that's financially feasible because it has market rate rents, 1100 to $2,000. Yeah. We're trying to build that with affordable housing, which is 60% AMI, the gap is four and a half million dollars. And that's really the math of what you're talking about. When you re underwrite it with rents that are six fifty or seven hundred dollars, we're now four and a half million dollars is, is the shortfall. And so what you ask the government to do is to is to fill that gap. So that's, yeah. that's, that's, that's where government yeah, that's financing can want. work. It, it takes that risk factor away that a private developer is not willing to, to do. Exactly. You're, you're willing to take it as long as it's there. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that's the whole thing. You we'll take it if it's there. But if just to have a person unilaterally tell you a value that's not day-to-day, -day, uh, 24 hours a day, thinking about this, thinking about that over a two-year period of time. So as long as it's fair, we're good. But once you start jumping into sort of creative numbers that don't make sense, then all of a sudden you get a, you know, these, these are, by the way, recourse loans. They're, they're, they're recourse loans. So not only are you guaranteeing that equity position, but you're also guaranteeing that's what we'll call the $10 million example or other. You're also personally guaranteeing the seven. So you got three hard, and then you got seven that you're personally. So a guy like me at 67 years old, who's worked 45 years, you're putting everything you've ever done on every deal on the table that it's gonna work. And to use the Walgreens as an example, when Dee and I did that, that was the toughest deal we ever did because we never knew if it was gonna work because it was such a restricted site. And would you believe by the time we got doing that project, this is inside information, but I'll share it with you here in this room. By the time we got doing that deal, the land was 2.6, the building was five, that's seven, six. And at the end of the day, we sold it at a, what's called the cap rate, which is the rate of return the investor's looking at. At a very aggressive cap rate for like, so when we sold the project, we actually had to bring cash to closing because of the fact that we had all these built-in extra costs in doing the deal. But, you know, uh, we did it because we were a part of the Walgreens family. So just be aware, and again, Didi, I offer this, if you all ever wanna have like a small group course on real estate, be happy to share because sometimes there's more to this whole animal than just bricks and mortar or, yeah. or, 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 or government or all this. So anyway, happy to come back and do any uh, one hour teaching episode. You, you feed me food, I'm, I'm here all day long. <laughs> Other than that, Mrs. Lincoln, how did you enjoy the play? Yeah. <laughs> well, I must like it because I've been doing it 40 years. <laughs> but I feel like it's I'm rich and petty. I feel like every time I get in my car, I don't know if I'm gonna end up back in the finish line or in pit, pit row after four hours of racing. But, but anyway, it's a great business. I'm just here to help whatever I can. Thank you. Well, it's real late. Any other, one last question. 
Okay, we can all go ahead and watch. Can I ask well, I think we got two hands. Two hands. If I start. I have a question. Um, I'm with the Wisdom Salem Foundation, and I wanted to share that on May 6th, um, we are having a two-day luncheon, and we're actually the theme will be um, undesigning the red line. And so we're going to bring in a couple of speakers to kind of look at the history of redlining in Winston Salem and try to figure out how we can create opportunities to respond to that. So that's thank you, thank you, appreciate it. Did y'all get that? Um, May 6th at the Veterans Convention Center. Um, the individual tickets have not gone on sale yet, but they will try in the next few weeks. There was one other. I yeah, it, it's actually kind of salient to that, that question. Is Does the city council have like a list of all these exclusionary laws and practices? Like that we can take to our, our march, i.e., like this no, is extreme. Because I mean, for me, for education, and then like telling people, like, hey, look at this. We have a restriction on the number of units per acre, yeah. which limits this kind of thing. We have the restriction on single family only in the Northwest Ward. Yeah, blah 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 blah. Yeah. Um, would be a good project. That's the zoning like regulations that we have. So uh, I would be glad to, if we, Jeff or I would be glad to give you our cards and we will connect you with the people in planning as well as uh, our legal department to just go in and cut it and send it to you so you get the ones that basically you can tell them what you need. That's part of your tax dollars at work. Thank you for coming. This has been quite an occasion. Uh, thank you to our panel. These are the expertise.